We are back with David Allen, historian and author of Every Citizen, a Statesman, The Dream of a Democratic Foreign Policy in the American Century. David, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for inviting me, Emma. Real joy to be here. Of course. So, um, you know, it's it's funny. Your book really just touches on, I think, this inherent understanding that a lot of Americans have whether it's from the left or like the conspiracy side of the right where they think that the deep state is, is subverting Donald Trump or whatever. But but there is this understanding, right, that American citizens just don't know what's happening our na- in our national security agencies and we don't have any control over them. And yet we live in a democracy. I mean, what made you want to explore that kind of fundamental tension? Or we're supposed to live in a democracy. Obviously, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's true and that's uh that's kind of where i came from i know that you had uh my friend and colleague uh, matthew connelly on the show a few weeks ago many years ago i was working with him on his project on official secrecy and i was getting into how the state has constructed you know classification in this secrecy regime and and seeing how limited the information that the public has is um and how how strong the debates were in the 1940s and 1950s when that regime was imposed And I figured that this cannot really have been how things were supposed to have turned out. This can't have been what a democratic foreign policy was supposed to look like. So then I started investigating what the alternatives were throughout the 20th century, 20th century American history. Yes. And um, I I really I, I will say I had a cynicism that your your book really did undercut um about how like maybe this is just in the 21st century how um foreign policy and is was destined to be essentially right it's it's um there when when people are in power they're very likely to create like a, a a secrecy uh, to protect themselves and do these kinds of covert actions. But, I mean, your historical focus like, undercuts that. Uh, talk a bit about the institutions that were starting to come into formation post-World War I and how there was really an alternative vision that ended up uh, kind of getting superseded after World War II. Yeah, absolutely. What I'm trying to show throughout is the for the last hundred years, or at least for the first half of the 20th century, there's been a real debate about about what the vision for making American foreign policy should be. Uh, And so we've ended up with this establishment, this elite, this blob, whatever you want to call it. Um, But if you ask a lot of the people who were really prominent in the making of American foreign policy up to the 60s, they would have been horrified by by this end result. They would have thought it was undemocratic. They would have called it undemocratic. They would have hated the very idea. And this in part was, a consequence of the institutions that you mentioned. So after World War One, when the United States is starting to throw its weight around in the world a little bit more than it had, um, especially in Asian and, and European politics, you get a bunch of dis- different institutions which is, which exist to kind of reconcile this more extrovert foreign policy with mass democracy at home. Um, they're all uh, the most important of them, the Foreign Policy Association, which was is kind of a nothing group now, but uh, was really important in the 20s, 30s and 40s, f- was filled with progressives, uh, you know, uh, Jane Addams and other suffragists down to real um, heavyweight activists who uh, and radicals even who uh, allied with much more conservative figures to try and uh, learn something about foreign policy, teach themselves something so that they could change the way the United States was acting in the world, and teach their fellow citizens. At the time, a fairly elite group of fellow, fellow citizens, uh, but fellow citizens nonetheless. So in the book, I trace how these that institution and, and several others coming out of it, um, over time, differently approach the question of a democratic foreign policy, who they think should be involved, who had the right to get involved, what they ought to know, uh, what their relationship to policymakers ought to be. It's a fairly dismal story, <laughs> as you say, by the 1960s, all of this has failed. Um, but I think it's a story worth telling, especially today. Well, let's tell it a little bit then there. You know, uh, what was the context in which this organization came to be, um, you know, uh, especially uh, in... Um, in relation to Woodrow Wilson and the United States's desire to make the U.S. this this major power on the world stage. 
I think that if you look at the kind of infrastructure of American foreign policy at the time, the State Department was a tiny, tiny, tiny organization. It had a couple of, a few hundred employees, uh, if that. Um, you couldn't run a kind of advanced foreign policy like Wilson, Wilson was trying simply from there. It didn't make any sense whatsoever. You needed to have um, more people who could potentially work for the State Department and other institutions. You needed to have people for uh, you know a public for them to speak to to kind of root foreign policy in democracy in some way otherwise the foreign policy was dangerous you know you can't just make policy on on the fly and not refer to a public democratically at all um and so uh there's a kind of general understanding that if the united states is going to to you know get more involved in european politics especially americans need to know uh, more about the world. Um, and they do this in a variety of different ways. I mean, I, I, they do it by researching. Foreign Policy Association is kind of the first real think tank for foreign policy. There weren't any of those at the time. There weren't even international relations departments in universities or anything like that. They hold, do it by holding kind of public meetings, big luncheons in high society, hotels, things like that. Um, and so there's a real sense at the time that this was a kind of collective endeavor that American foreign policy wouldn't succeed unless it was kind of deeply rooted um, in at least some kind of American public, not necessarily everybody by any means, but at least some p citizens out there uh, beyond Washington. Yes. And and so, I mean, what th that was a competing viewpoint, right? What were the opposite kind of institutions that were uh, forming that ended up obviously being victorious. So this is where the conspiracy theories kick in, really. <laughs> um, this is so. On the other side, you have the the State Department itself, which was never entirely certain that this was a good idea, and you have the Council on Foreign Relations, essentially, um, which uh, then, as now, was um, a very small, limited group, invite only, all men, all rich men, uh, um, white men. Uh, which believed that it essentially had the exclusive right to talk about U.S. foreign policy and impose its views on on everybody else. It didn't think that, you know, whereas the Foreign Policy Association thought there was safety in kind of public knowledge and public debate, um, the Council on Foreign Relations only saw danger in that. Now, um, the association and a bunch of other institutions were were way more powerful than the Council on Foreign Relations until World War II. Um, when there's a kind of fairly complicated series of maneuvers that the council pulls, which gets it close to the, to the much closer to the State Department. Um, but for a long time, this view that foreign policy had to be restricted to a very narrow group of people was not powerful at all. Uh, it was roundly mocked. Uh, hmm. And it didn't really, even if the council became powerful in the 1940s, the idea that its views about public opinion were kind of controlling or correct was not true until the 1960s. Even as late as the 1960s, you can find secretaries of state saying, we need to root foreign policy in the American people. We need to educate the people. We, there needs to be kind of collective participation. Uh, it's only after that that the establishment, weirdly as a result of Vietnam, when the establishment hmm. gets wrapped criticized weirdly it takes power after that i mean it's bigger than it was uh, prior to that but it, it that's when the shift really finally irreversibly comes the cold war i mean right like is is that too simple of an explanation it's not too simple of an explanation um so definitely public partic widespread public participation in the making of american foreign policy becomes way more difficult after 1945, simply because the United States is involved in many, many more places all over the world. Um, that's one thing. So a citizen could be expected to, you know, policymakers hoped that citizens or thought that citizens needed to, you know, have much more knowledge about a wider, uh, wider range of topics. It's also true that public participation in nuclear weapons are not necessarily a great mix. I mean, you right. can't have a <laughs> referendum on, on nuclear weapon use. And so, um, as the United States foreign policy in the 40s, 50s, and 60s starts to turn more on the nuclear issue and, and the relationship with the Soviet Union, there are obvious arguments for cutting the public out as much as possible. Um, because it, it, it's, you know, even people who, who 
believed in mass public participation in foreign policy thought that that on nuclear weapons was, was could be quite difficult no, um, and and how much of the the um competing and, and eventually victorious uh, apparatus um sees uh, that were trying to wall off foreign policy from democracy how much of that had to do with uh the beginning of the United States becoming a real empire globally in terms of wanting to extract res resources from other nations and that being a fundamental part of why, you know, guys like the Dulleses wanted the uh, how they wanted the, the um, United States government to function and enrich themselves. I think it's easy to con to see conspiracies where where there's mostly just inco incompetence and and you know, gotcha. individual actors all over the place. A lot of it certainly. Is. I mean, the rise of the Council on Foreign Relations in particular is directly tied to kind of planning for empire. Um, I don't know if any of your readers have read uh, or know of Stephen Wertheim or or if he's been yes. on the show or anything. But, he's been on the show but, a few times. Yeah. Or yeah, lot, but, but in, in, in his book, Tomorrow of the World, he shows very carefully how the council is really involved in in creating a blueprint for world preeminence or world domination, whatever you want to call it, in, in the 1940s. Um, and then that simply gets sold to the public in 1944-45. You either take it or you leave it, and it's very clear that, they have to, that the public has to take it. Uh, and once that planning happens behind closed doors, uh, in secret as it does in the early 1940s, that template is is set. Uh, and so you see again and again in the 40s and 50s that plans for American foreign policy are hatched behind closed doors and then simply sometimes not referred to the public at all, um, more often than not in some respects. Uh, but when they're important and require a lot of domestic resources like the Marshall Plan or, or, or things like this, Essentially, the DAC is stacked. The public is given a take it or leave it option, uh, and uh, there's only one way in which they can really answer. So yes, approve the Marshall Plan, or you're an isolationist, um, et cetera, et cetera, through on, throughout American history. Um, and, and so I guess let's then turn to the uh, the World War II, where things really begin to shift, and some mm. of you know the consensus really begins to get. Um, muddied i guess right because uh, the 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 uh, i guess i'm sorry i'm forgetting the name of it is it the fpa the the yeah. the the uh, acronym yeah the, the fpa starts to become a little bit more tied to what fdr wants to do um as you write and he obviously ends up uh, getting the united states involved in world war ii um talk a bit about how that fundamental change happens well, they do it for for what at the time seemed like good patriotic reasons, right? I mean, the 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 the, the culture of service and deference to power then is it was very different to what it would be like um, now. They they see it as part of their duty in, in World War II to do what the president wants, and the president is very solicitous. Um, you know, he was a former member of the FPA. His wife had been on the board. They were very close. Um, and things are still open by the end of World War II. It's not clear what a democratic foreign policy will look like. In fact, the State Department at the end in 1945 goes around telling everybody that State Department that, that the foreign policy of the United States is merely the expression of the will of the people, and that there's going to be this new cooperative model of foreign policy, which by 1947 is just a joke. Um, but uh, everything gets closer to the state, and then the state after World War II gets, you know, dramatically bigger. Um, much more powerful. You get the construction of the national security state um, essentially on as a kind of continuation of wartime state making. I mean, that's what the, the, the reason the Cold War is a Cold War in the United States is because it's patterned on, on the methods of World War II in terms of how you fight it, how you create a state, how you continue a state. Um, and so the public is, you know, it, it's, it's hard once those institutions um, have been created, something like the National Security Council, or, you know, the, the Defense Department, once um, those institutions have been created uh, and debate about the future of American foreign policy has been taken into those institutions uh, rather than held in public, it's very hard to kind of overcome the inertia that that sets up. Right. I mean, and, and it, it just snowballs, essentially, right? I mean, the United States 
I, I would I so if if the Cold War is this kind of inflection point for um a lot of these anti democratic Im- impulses and and moves, I mean nine eleven and the war on terror puts that on steroids. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, this is why <laughs> you know I I end the book with kind of a cop out. Um, you know, I'm not a particularly radical guy myself. I don't have easy answers to to any of this. Um, it's hard now to suggest to come up with concrete proposals as to how the United U.S. foreign policy could be like dramatically democratized because it's just like inconceivable. I mean, there's what would it look like? Mm-hmm. Um, nobody really can 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 really tell and especially the distance between what we have now and what an ideal might be is so vast that getting from a to b is is really difficult and that is yes a function of later history than the 60s and and 70s when it was still possible as the anti-war radicals did to propose alternatives and imagine a better world um now it's much harder uh in fact you know there have been a couple of there have been kind of two competing schools of reviews of my book. One, one of kind of optimism that something is possible, or at least you know, in terms of ideas, and the other just completely pessimistic about the idea, about the whole thing. Uh, and I think that's kind of telling. It's kind of hard to come to a consensus that something could be done. Well, has has there any been has there been any historical examples of um, the? Uh, inclusion of democratic models in foreign policy i know it's really difficult to 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 map that out especially because there's no equivalent country to the united states in this way right there's no there's no this is why the effort comes about after world war one and especially after, uh, and during world war Two in the first place because you know the united states has unfathomable power on the world stage in that period as it still does today but it also has a fairly well developed although you know racist and, and you know contested democracy uh, at the time, you needed to find some way to reconcile it. You couldn't just act like Great Britain. You couldn't act like the Roman Empire and, and keep it to uh, keep the ruling of it to a very narrow group of people. Um, so uh, no, there haven't been any great examples except from the United States own past. Uh, and that's the story I, I tell. Um, but I don't think the United States ever approached the ideal. There were parts in, in you know, in, in World War II, it, it got closer. Um, the public definitely felt a real sense of participation in joining the United Nations, for instance. Mm. Um, uh, and there was a kind of participatory foreign policy around United Nations issues really into the 1950s. But that's because policymakers allowed it, allowed that to happen because they didn't really think that kind of thing was that important <laughs> in the Cold right. War. And so it's oh. an outlet for kind of activist energies. What about the the rise of think tanks, things like the Rand Corporation and other like thought uh, hallowed halls, foreign policy thinkers that um, like that kind of cottage industry? So in a sense, you can call that participation of of a kind. Um, Definitely think tankers think of themselves as kind of representing the public in foreign policy (laughs) debate. Uh, Right. And that's how they were set up. I mean, if you read Daniel Bessner's research, for instance, on, on Rand in the, in the late 40s and 50s, it was explicitly set up um, on a very p- pessimistic model about public participation. The idea that we ha- we as experts have knowledge that the public does not and cannot have, and therefore we will represent the public to the government instead. So the whole kind of infrastructure was built on the idea that the public couldn't do this kind of thing. So ex- so think tank experts had to do. It's not just think tanks. I mean, it was through area studies programs and universities and everything. Um, these really crop up in the 50s. And again, just like with the national security state, once the institutions develop and develop power, they become very, very sticky. Um, some of you know the former... Uh, and, and unwilling to give up that power, the power. There's a really interesting and completely unread report that came out of the Carnegie Endowment just before um, uh, just before the 2020 election, uh, I think, in which the current national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, writes quite eloquently about you know public participation and the need for more of it. Um, but the power that, that 
he actually wants to give to the public is is minuscule. Um, we're tinkering around the edges rather than offering radical change here. So yeah, it's it's the same kind of thing. Sticky institutions that are very hard to to change. Yeah, I mean, and I guess we we have not really said the word CIA yet. Um, <laughs> sure. I mean, it, like the the creation of such a powerful uh, international intelligence agency, that's got to be uh, a bit of the, the nail in the coffin and uh, for the idea of democratic participation in foreign policy, really, I guess, um, I, when it comes to us, at least in, the, in this country. Yeah, I think so. Um, definitely uh, the CIA, for sure, by the, by, by the early 1950s. The Defense Department itself, once you start running a lot of what could be called foreign policy out of a military institution, there's a long history, uh, even among progressives um, in, in, in the American story of kind of suspending is not the right word, but kind of weakening democratic impulses in a time of war. And if you define foreign policy as the United States has done from since the 1940s as essentially warlike, or if you define our times as, as you know, constant near war as it was in the cold war um then it's very hard for democratic values to kind of impinge on that you know um it, it's kind of a, a it's a vicious circle uh, very very quickly absolutely well uh david allen historian author of every citizen the statesman the dream of a democratic foreign policy in the american century thank you so much for your time today uh, we will put a link to the book in the podcast description on our website youtube description as well thanks so much david Thanks so much, Emma.